I got hired 13 months ago, and, and as many people that have heard me speak, it was my dream job. I grew up in a little western Pennsylvania town and referred to our hometown as a Hoosier town and didn't realize always why I did that, but uh, we came from a crazy basketball town growing up in western Pennsylvania, and we just thought, well, that's what the Hoosier state was, that everyone had a basketball hoop in their driveway, in their barn, at the end of the street, at the park, and uh, I always looked at Indiana as a sleeping giant in women's basketball coaching in the Midwest. So 13 months ago when the job opened and, I, and the dream became reality and, and Fred called me up and offered me the job, I jumped at the chance. And last year's uh, tailgate tour was fantastic because I was the only undefeated coach out there speaking. <laughs> and uh, when you think about it, I, I started my tailgate tour last year and I had gotten to work with the returning players for two hours in the spring before the semester ended. And we weren't able to work with our kids last summer. The NCAA rules didn't permit it. So I was out talking about the future and really didn't know exactly what we had in-house. In but I knew we had nine returning players and we needed to change the culture. And we, we needed to rebuild this program. And, and during the interview process, I told Fred and, and the staff that if they were looking for a quick fix, that I wasn't their man, that I wasn't their coach, because I was going to do it the right way. And we were going to build this program not only to win again, but to do it right on and off the court. And we, in doing it right on and off the court, we, we were committed to building a program that once we turn, as Coach Crean likes to say, as the program turns, that we were going to be able to sustain it. And that's what we were so proud of at Bowling Green. Uh, we won our last eight divisional championships in the MAC. Seven out of the eight were outright regular season championships, and we had a great run. And I'm more proud of the sustained success and excellence that we did than getting there uh, and, and being up and down team and being a one-hit wonder. I remember Dan Dockage after the first uh, conference championship that we had used to sing one hit wonder songs to our girls walking around just to remind them that you didn't want to be a one hit wonder and I owe a lot to Dan he speaks very highly of, of me in this area and probably without him I'm not a Hoosier right now but um, so we started out um, formulating a plan and we have a simple philosophy in women's basketball that you have to build the championship in the locker room you have to have a championship locker room before a championship can be won on the court. And what we mean by that is that my staff and I are going to be out recruiting great character kids. We want the full package. Basketball brings us in the lives of a lot of young girls uh, that are looking for a future in Division I college basketball. But basketball is only a small story. Of, of what we want as Hoosiers. It's the character piece that's important. We want women that thrive for academic excellence and really compete in that classroom. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, are willing to represent IU 24 seven and really be out there with community service and, and representing what it's all about to be a Hoosier. And, and I don't wanna worry about the players that I bring in and the decisions that they're making at night. I no longer am at the point in my career that I want to sleep with my cell phone next to me. Um, and, I, and I'm committed to doing that. So that is our philosophy, building a championship locker room before we can build a championship on the court. So we made it through the summer, and school year st finally started. And now I finally get to work with the team. And this is where a fine line was drawn. Because for the last eight years, the success or failure of my coaching at Bowling Green all revolved if you won a championship or not. If you were a champion, you were successful. If you weren't a championship team again, it was a non-successful year. Well, I knew that was unrealistic in, in taking over the program. And there was a fine line drawn because I wanted the team to hear that I believed in them. I wanted to hear the, the, them to hear the message that we could overachieve. I wanted them to hear that we could build something special, but we also had to set realistic goals and, and not lie to them. Honesty is a big part of how I coach, and I, and I wanted them to hear the honesty and, and hear what I was trying to say. Now, it's hard. There's a fine line because sometimes you worry that the players are hearing that coach is saying that we're no good that we can't beat this team or we can't beat that time team because one of the things that I like to share with them was we weren't the most talented team. 
a lot of nights going into games. But that had no effect on if we could win or lose the game. But I wanted them to know that we were not the most talented team. Now, I digress and tell you another story. I talked to our team a lot about a three-letter word, and that's being fit. And we want to have great fitness, and we want to, we want to continue to be uh, as fit as team as possible. Well, they like to change that one vowel. And when I talk about fit, sometimes through the years with women's basketball players, they come out and change that I to an A. And they are like, coach called me fat again. And it's not the truth. And so we are talking about fitness. Well, when I'm trying to talk to the team that we're not the most talented team, it doesn't have any effect on if we could be the better team for two hours that night or we could overachieve and do something very special. So we didn't set goals this year in terms of wins losses. We set realistic goals that we wanted to be the hardest working team each and every night we played. In fact, we wanted to be the hardest working team in the Big Ten. In the other area where I really believe championships are won in women's basketball is we wanted to be the best chemistry team. We wanted to have the best chemistry in that locker room and have a drama-free locker room with 15 girls. So we, and it's not always easy. So, so we started out. So we started out, and that, that was the goals this year. And, and we, we really started the bond. Uh, the message to my players over the summer, last summer, and into the fall was we had to do things together. We had to get out of our comfort zone and spend time together. The captains had to get us together. And you could feel something brewing, and this team was getting closer and closer. So we went into non-conference, and, and, and both uh, Don just talked about we had a disappointing opening season loss. And we're 0-1, and, and we're disappointed. We didn't play hard. In fact, I didn't think we gave great effort down the stretch when it looked like in the last couple minutes we were going to come up short. But we regrouped, and then over the next 12 non-conference games, we went 9-3. and three. And we won 75% of our games. We won the ACC Challenge and beat Clemson at home and, and beat some other very talented teams. And all of a sudden, we won 75% of our non-conference games over those last 12 games. And to put in perspective of what that nine-win non-conference is, is only three teams in the last 30 years in IU women's basketball history have won more than nine games. So we had a very successful and surprising non-conference. But we were realistic about the competition that we were playing. I inherited a schedule that could be successful. So then the Big Ten started. And lo and behold, we found ourselves second Big Ten game of the year in a, in a dogfight with Northwestern. And we made some big plays down the stretch. And all of a sudden, we were one and one. They had won one Big Ten game the entire previous year. We are now up to 10 wins on the year, and they had only won six games the entire year before, so we're feeling pretty good about ourselves. But as with most sports teams comes adversity, and adversity hit us in that second semester. Not everyone always buys into the culture that you're trying to create when you take over a program, and we needed to part ways with a few players. So a year that only started with 10 scholarship players eligible to play was down to eight, and then our starting point guard broke her wrist. So we were down to seven scholarship players to play the majority of the Big Ten. Now, you would say, well, seven, you can still hang in there. Well, our two kids off the bench were both centers. So we had three scholarship guards last year for the entire Big Ten play. We needed a walk-on to be able to take any of the guards out at any time. We didn't have a backup. We didn't have backup wings. We didn't have a backup four. We had two fives off the bench, and we had to make the best of it. So we were competitive. We played hard. We put ourselves in position to be successful at times, but we knew we were undermanned, and a lot of nights we came up short. But the one other Big Ten win on the year, and I think this room would agree, if you were going to pick one Big Ten to team to beat, was we got Purdue at home late in the year. <laughs> Purdue was nationally ranked at the time. Their back-to-back -back Big Ten uh, tournament, uh, Big Ten tournament 
title winners uh, in the league, but uh, we got them when they were ranked in the top 25 in the country, and we were very excited about that win. In fact, we were in the last five games of the regular season. We led at one point in all five of those games late in the game and, uh, and felt like we had really, really turned the corner. And it meant a lot to me that our fans came up and said, even though we were coming up short a lot of the games, that our kids were playing hard because that was our one major goal that was tangible and not necessarily the win-loss record. So the season ended, we gave them two quick weeks off, and they were hungry. They were anxious to get back to work more than any team that I've coached, even through all those championships. And right as we were getting back to work after the Final Four, the NCAA passed a rule that for the first time in women's basketball, we have summer access, means I get to coach them this summer. And it's not a lot, but I get eight weeks, two hours a week. I get 16 hours to coach this team this summer, and what a better time as we build. Every single one of our returners has decided to stay for the entire summer. It's the first time that women's basketball has stayed for the entire summer. Not one session, both sessions. And they're working like crazy. Add into the fact that we now have Tom Morris back in our program, who is our phenomenal strength coach, who just a year ago had the tragic bicycle accident, which has left him paralyzed. There's not a better strength coach in the country. I know Coach Yegley will talk about Tom also and how much he means to our programs. He works with soccer and women's basketball. And now I have one of the elite strength coaches back working with our program day in and day out. Well, if that's not an inspiration, when you show up, and they show up every morning at 6.30 in the morning to work out in the summer, if they're feeling sorry for themselves, they look over at Tom in the wheelchair ready to push them to higher limits and push them to their, to their max. How can you feel sorry for yourself when you're looking at Tom Morris sitting there ready to coach his guts out to make them better and be ready for the season? So we were off to a great start this summer. I'm really proud how we've bonded and continued to do things as a team behind the scenes and really grow as a program. But we know we have hard work uh, cut out for us. It was a successful season. Not always tangible in wins and losses, but we've improved in a lot of areas. We had the fourth best increase in attendance, which is a great thing as a new program and the excitement around our program. I wasn't really satisfied with our academic start, and I've been preaching about thriving for academic excellence with our team. And we only had around a 3.0 in the fall semester. And I just didn't think that was acceptable. So we rallied the troops and we talked about academics and my assistant coaches really pushed them. And I'm happy to report that our team got a 3.23 in the spring semester academically. I will tell you also that our team learned and got involved with the community more than they've ever been to the point where one night on a Sunday, I was sitting at home and my phone started to buzz and I was getting all sorts of updates on Twitter and social media and I started looking at them all and our team was posting pictures on both Facebook and Twitter and I didn't understand where they were or what, when were these pictures taken. On their own, a group of 10 scholarship women's basketball players on their own found out that a cancer patient, a boy nine years old, and his family was in town in Bloomington and one of our players from out of state knew the family. They gathered the team together, invited the family to Cook Hall, and spent an hour shooting baskets with the family and taking pictures with this cancer patient and boy and their family with no coaches involved, with no coaches urging, with no media presence, not doing it to try to get us in the paper and to spin positive press about our program. Just did it because it was the right thing. And I knew then we were building something special because they were learning that we were gonna give back to this community that has afforded them the opportunity to be a scholarship athlete at an unbelievable institution. So we're excited about the future. We're excited about the future. We've recruited a, our guts out since we've got here. And we got here at this time last year, or about 13 months ago, and we immediately had to try to salvage a 2013 recruiting class. Well, we believe we did more than salvage. We signed six high school seniors. 
that our class got ranked in the top 30 in the country and the third best Big Ten recruiting class within months of our arrival. We're bringing in two point guards, two wings, and two post players. We also have brought back into the program three transfers, uh, one being Kayla Halls, a Bloomington native whose brother Jordan Halls was one of the starting guards on the team this year, who's a phenomenal player to have back. We stole her from Bloomington and took her to Bowling Green, and she transferred back with me and brought her back home to an amazing family in Bloomington and J.C. Halls and, and their family, so we're, we're proud to have her back. But when I inherited the program, we had three Hoosiers on our entire roster. Three. Not, coincidentally, our two best players and two leading scorers this year were Hoosier natives. So we set out to rebuild this program by recruiting the state and working hard to protect not only our state but our borders in the Big Ten footprint. And in the first 10, 13 months, I'm proud to announce that we have signed four Indiana Hoosiers that were all-stars and senior all-stars. Not only did we sign four Indiana players that will join our program for the first time on the court next year, we also have brought in numerous Indiana walk-ons. I've hired a, a, my director of basketball operations, was a former great player in the state, and I'm currently looking at new candidates for my open graduate assistant position and, and uh, feel really, really good about the candidate pool and feel good about bringing more and more Hoosiers into our program. So I'm excited about that. So the future is bright, but I ask for your patience. Uh, we, we do have 10 players that will impact our program that didn't play this year with us, but will be very young. It's not inconceivable to believe that we will start four freshmen or four players that did not play in our program last year. Uh, it would not shock us at all. And uh, we're excited about the infusion of young talent, but we also know it is young talent, and it is a tough conference to win with young players. But uh, we're excited, and again, we might not, the, the second year, and, and I told Fred when I was interviewing, he probably didn't like when I said it, I thought, we could be 0-32 in the Big Ten before we start turning this around, and he was like, nah. And I'm like, no, seriously, we, we, we have some rebuilding to do, and, and I, I think he knows, but um, I'm really excited about it, and I can't talk specifically about future recruiting, but our 2014 recruiting class is off the charts right now and off to a great start. And for, for that class, and that class has made a lot of inroads on pigs. I didn't know what pigs was when I got there, and everyone kept on coming up to me going, you're appearing on pigs. And I was like, well, is that good or bad? And they're like, they never talk about women's basketball on pigs, and they're talking about women's basketball, and it's a web fan website that is a great chat room for a lot of our men's sports, but women's basketball has never gotten chatter on there. Well, we have chatter on there now about our future recruits that are, that are creating a buzz in our entire program. So that is our catchword right now. There is a buzz around our program, and we still have years ahead of us to rebuild. But it's nice to have Coach Crean across that hallway that he knows, and, and I can ask him questions as we try to rebuild this. It didn't happen overnight for them. He reminds me they won 28 games their first three years, and, uh, and, and now back-to-back -back Sweet 16s and a Big Ten title. Indiana women's basketball hasn't won a regular season title since 83. This year meant the, this, this year marked the 30th anniversary since that last championship team. But there is a buzz in our program. And right now, that buzz, we are, the buzz I refer to it is, we are the a little annoying brother to Purdue and Notre Dame. But somewhere soon, you guys, we're going to be the big bully. Thank you. All right. Proud to be here. Come out and support us. 15 home games. 15 home games. And one of the biggest things that we're looking to change, right, recent conversation, I'll leave you this. We were a 500 team this year when we played teams 51 and down. We were 1 and 9 against teams in the top 50. But we were 500 against teams 51 through 350, however many Division I teams there are nowadays. And I'm on the phone. And I was sharing that statistic, saying 500 team when we played schools outside of the top 50, but we were only one in nine. 
Uh, we've got to get better against the top 50. And the voice on the other line said, no, you've got to get back to your roots, and you've got to never have bad losses. And one of the things that we did so special at Bowling Green is not all the top 25 wins and not all those big wins do I remember about all the championships. We took pride. We never had a bad loss. We never lost a game that we weren't supposed to. We never had that. And so many people think that we need to improve our record immediately against the top 50. I, that phone call, and I thanked her, and I said, Mom, thank you for reminding me. I, we got to get this program to never have any bad losses, and we've got to improve as we build I, to have a better record against those teams outside of the top 50. Always a pleasure to be here, honor to represent women's sports, but we have the best. We're going to finish with the number one men's athletic program in the country this year when we win, when we finish up with baseball and track. And you're going to hear from three great ones tonight. All right? Thank you for having me.